welcome to the second interview of the ICLID Center. Today our guest is Professor Tommaso Ferrando. Uh, he is research professor at the University of Antwerp uh, and at the Institute of Policy Development at the same university. Uh, he has very broad research interests. You can probably speak and talk about whatever you want with him. But if I had to summarize them, I would say that they uh, can be divided into two main strands. The first one being uh, the study of the link between law and food, while the second focuses more on law, finance and sustainability and international trade as well. Thomas is also very active in uh, advising um, NGOs and the civic society and in participating in grassroots initiatives. Probably also for this reason, he had this idea, together with his co-author Davide Cerrato, uh, to write a paper about the financialization of civil society, activism, sustainable finance and the shrinking of bottom-up engagement. Uh, in his paper, in their paper, they uh, start by unpacking the Directive 95-2014, requiring certain European Union companies to annually report on the environmental, social and governance impact of, it, of their activities, ESG. You will hear this ESG a lot throughout this conversation, uh, which is also the so-called non-financial performance of companies. Uh, now, uh, what they try to do, and they, I would say that they do that very successfully, um, they try to adopt a novel approach to ESG reporting by looking into whether this, this directive in particular, but also the overall regulatory framework, succeed in spurring the participation of the civil society uh, and of all the other stakehold stakeholders that are interested, directly or indirectly, but mostly directly interested in this uh, ESG reporting. Um, so, Tommaso, in your paper you adopt a novel approach to environmental, social and governance reporting. Can you tell us a little bit more about ESG reporting in general and how you drafted this paper in the first place? Hello Claudio, hi everyone. Thanks a lot for having me. Thanks a lot for this opportunity to share with you some of the findings of this uh, paper that we co-authored with uh, David Cerrato, as you were saying, and that came out on um, accounting, economics and law uh, on well two months ago in, uh, in 2020. So the, the idea was to, to look as you said at the uh, directive the 95 2014 which is a directive on accounting and reporting for corporations of a certain size and a certain relevance at the European level and ask ourselves different questions. And different questions because we were aware and we are aware that uh, ESG and accounting and reporting for sustainability have been widely and broadly discussed, both at the level of academia and at the level of policymakers and, and practitioners. Um, and that's why uh, we were interested. We were interested in looking at something that has been discussed already, that has been reflected upon, but hadn't been really tackled from, from the angle and the perspective that we wanted to adopt which is that of the implementation from the perspective of civil society organizations and the perspective of people like myself and David that were actively engaged in processes of, of social transformation, uh, in particular with regards to, to climate change and, uh, and climate uh, emergency. So ESG reporting uh, is something that somehow follows the pathway or the journey or corporate social responsibility reporting. So for the last decade, uh, there have been increasing attempts to take corporate activities and introduce metrics, introduce standards, and introduce indexes that could define whether or not this corporation were well behaving. Uh, historically, that was the case of corporate social responsibility that came uh, strongly into play towards the end of the last century uh, when the evidence that a lot of corporate activities were negatively impacting a society where almost impossible to, to forget or almost impossible not to not to see. So we had a lot of these attempts to introduce standards and practices and voluntary guidelines um, in terms of corporate social responsibility, as I said, but also due diligence. How are you behaving as a, as a corporation? How are you behaving in particular as a transnational corporation? And that's the work that also the OECD has been doing with the guidelines, the work of the rugby principles in terms of uh, corporate conduct and, and human rights around the world, and etc. 
The ESG comes after that, but somehow follows the same trajectory, as I said, in the sense that it tries to systematize a little bit broadly and a little bit in a better way, what are the different ways in which private actions can have an impact uh, on the world around them. And that's why they identify three areas of, of interest. The first one, the, the E, is the environment, so talking about environmental degradation, climate change, the impact that uh, corporate activities can have on, on the planet. The second one is the social impact, and that is as undefined as it can be, but it involves issues, uh, for example, like employment, uh, human rights, the, the capacity of the private actions and private activities to thrive and support uh, social development. And then there is the governance aspect, like the third letter of the ESG, uh, which doesn't really look at the relationship between the corporation and the surrounding, but looks at the way in which the corporation is organized internally. So the way in which decisions are made, transparency, whether or not there are problems in terms of tax avoidance, what are the important structures within the company, etc. The main difference between corporate social responsibility and ESG, we think, and that's something that is also pretty much clear from the, uh, from the literature on the topic, is that CSR was aimed at civil society, CSR and corporate social responsibility, accounting and reporting and etc. were pretty much out there to give the impression to the broader public that corporations were behaving or misbehaving in case they were not following these, uh, these implications. In the case of ESG, it seems to us that the uh, dialogue is not so much with or exclusively with civil society, NGOs, the third sector, and the citizens in general, but it's pretty much with finance. So the idea is to start a dialogue and start an interaction between corporate private actors and the financial world, which is based on, on a series of assumptions that ESG proponents and ESG rhetoric takes for, for granted that we wanted to assess, address, and challenge. So it is all done in the last 10 years, I would say, if not a little bit longer, in the framework of uh, financialization of development, in the framework of we need finance as an ally in the construction of a, of a better world. Uh, there is, for example, a clear statement by the European Parliament in 2017 uh, on climate finance, which is one of the ways in which uh, financial actors, corporations, and climate change comes together. And finance and climate finance back then in 2017 were considered an essential tool for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. So ESG differs from the corporate social responsibility, we think, because it brings in a player that is the financial capital and financial investors that were somehow absent before in the narrative and in the conversation around corporate social responsibility. And so in this paper, we wanted to ask ourselves what happens and what are the differences and what are the transformations from a legal perspective, but also from a socioeconomic perspective, when you bring in finance, when you start talking to finance, and when you establish a legal framework and a regulatory framework that brings together what uh, David Mochertin has, has called the uh, coalition of the unlikely, brings together players that would normally not talk to each other, like financial actors, trade unions, and civil society, to establish a new arena where they can dialogue, talk, use similar vocabulary in order to assess the performances of, of corporate players. So that was the, the somehow the background that, that we had, and then we can talk broadly like more in the like, coming of this, of this uh, chat about what we think is, is new and what we, what we did. But it's important before we move on that I also stress how that sort of dialogue with finance and the financialization of environmental and social improvement is not limited to the directive, the 95 to 2014, that we analyze in the paper, but it's really coming to prominence uh, at the European level, but also at the global level. And it's a process that started a couple of decades ago with the Monterey Declaration on Development Finance, and is now somehow normalized in most of the conversations, the political conversation and the regulatory conversation that are, that are happening, even more at the time of COVID. And I think they were really at a crucial moment where uh, policymakers at the European level, policymakers at the US level, and policymakers around the world are increasingly looking at finance as a support, as an opportunity to restart or relaunch after, uh, after COVID and after the economic uh, paralysis and the economic downturn. So the conversation that we were having around the ESG before COVID is even more important now because before COVID, 
there were still some spaces of intervention where it seemed that governments could be doing without finance or without private finance. Now, after COVID, because of the collapse of GDP and the collapse of what are the traditional economic terms of reference for governments, it seems that the only solution is finance. So from now on, we will see even more financialization, even more financial players, even more financial actors, and the ESG uh, narrative or the ESG framework will become uh, normalized and universalized. So we see increasingly the attempts by policymakers to use the ESG as a as an opportunity to dialogue with finance, but also to dialogue with, this, with civil society, to promise to civil society that uh, the finance and corporations are behaving and are acting according to specific parameters. And just to give a couple of, uh, of hints and ideas of, of why that is it's relevant, uh, we have in Europe, which is the, the situation that I know better, uh, we have been having in the last six months a series of very relevant interventions by the European Commission and the European Union in general. We had the, the publishing of the taxonomy of green investments, which means the EU deciding what is green and, and what is not. Uh, we had the establishment of a high panel, uh, high level panel of experts on sustainable finance that is trying to come up with new regulatory pro uh, proposals and new directives uh, in order to channel and intensify the presence and the possibility for for finance to invest sustainably. Uh, we had a regulation in, uh, in 2018 that is extending the accounting and reporting on ESG from corporations to institutional investors like pension funds, for example, or even uh, large scale private equity funds. So the framework uh, that we analyzed in the case of the 2014 is now growing and is expanding and is encompassing even more areas of the, of the economy. And is happening out of two, I think, two dynamics. The first dynamic is the creation of a narrative and a rhetoric of need and essentialness. And on the other hand, you have the intervention of the public regulator that sets the standards, the frameworks, and the, and the regulatory space within which then financial actors are, are operating. And these are really the two things that we wanted to look at. How is that narrative created? What is the regulatory space? And what are the implications for the non-financial actors that at the end of the day are also considered to be a part of this, um, of this trend. And, and just before I, I finish on this, uh, on this point, I think that I, I wanted to quote something that the European Commission itself is uh, mentioning, but I can't really find the exact, the exact quote. But the moment where the European Commission was pushing for 95-2014, uh, it clearly stated that accounting and reporting for ESG was also about providing information to civil society, but also about the possibility for civil society to act as a watchdog, was also about increasing transparency in order to uh, raise the, the threshold of accountability, raise the threshold of uh, behaviors and conduct of, of corporations. So since the inception, uh, there is this idea that the Commission and the European Union are doing that also for and with the support of civil society and the, and the third sector. So we consider them as a crucial element and a crucial player in this dialogue, but we really want to see what happens and what are the positive elements and the negative elements and what civil society in the third sector are winning and what they're losing when they enter into this ESG uh, narrative. Okay, yeah. I, thanks very much. Actually, uh, you, before you mentioned the, um, the, the historical background of all these problems, saying that you know you you, you briefly mentioned the fact that th this is not everything is new, and indeed I like very much also in your paper this historical introduction to problems of environmental and social reporting. Uh, we've probably forgotten that uh, this is exactly not in uh, and this is nothing new that we have discovered only recently, but this is this was something that we've probably forgotten with the uh, uh, with, with the revolution, with the economic revolution of the 80s, end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, with the uh, neoclassic repress theory, the school that you know uh, started to sway over the also the political discourse, if you want, if you want. And indeed, at some point, you say that this is also a, a, a political, a part of the political agenda. Uh, it could it couldn't be otherwise that though it has to be translated into laws. 
and, uh, and, and, and you very well discuss the European Liga, the EU Liga framework, because this, this paper of yours is mainly focused on the EU laws. Um, and uh, so you, you, you discuss the law in the books, but you also, I like very much also your investigation, for example, into the uh, composition of these um, different committees or anyway in, in this, of these debates uh, among uh, stakeholders that have been organized uh, in particular for the adoption of these EU laws. So you not only look at the final stage, the law in the books, uh, what's, what's written in there, but you also looked at uh, how and by whom these laws were shaped. Uh, or anyway, who had the opportunity to lobby um, throughout this process, right? So yeah, I think um, yeah. Uh, sorry for, for jumping in, but I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's an important point, and it's really something that I am trying to do increasingly. And I think that this specific topic really offers the opportunity to go that uh, that direction because it's a new area. I, you're right; it's old in the sense that the attempt to introduce voluntary guidelines, non-mandatory elements or mandatory elements in sending reporting indexes and find ways of balancing the interest of private capital and private accommodation with the broader interest of society and environment has been happening for 80 years or for 100 years. Like uh, we, in the paper, we made reference to the debate that took place after the Second World War and that really there was this idea that the public and the regulator have to intervene, steer and direct but also to hold them accountable. And so there was much more uh, presence and participation than as we all know, there is the neoliberal turn in the eighties where the idea is that the state has to provide the level playing field for market players to operate, that has to guarantee the content of the market, that has to guarantee contracts, that has to guarantee property, but then doesn't really have to intervene in a hierarchical way with authoritarianism, doesn't have to impose, but just has to, to nudge so that those who are most efficient, most effective, uh, with that drive and the competition and all the other things. But we really see like throughout history that it's a sort of um, roller coaster where the, the role of the, the state and the role of authority, uh, the role of command vis-a-vis -vis incentives uh, changes depending also of the, of the surrounding. And what we mentioned in the paper is that the financial crisis of 2008-2009 was a catalyst of a lot of critiques and a lot of disappointment vis-a-vis -vis finance and vis-a-vis -vis corporations. There were people of fine party party, there were people of fine squares around the world, there were people like rioting in Northern Africa with so-called other extreme, there were people who lost their jobs, somehow something similar to what we're seeing now. And the response of the, of the public authority, and in particular the response at the European level, was that of saying, okay, how can we intervene and provide a framework and a, and, a, and a narrative that is at the same time giving the impression that we care about regulating, that we care about defining the way in which finance is operating because it's clear that finance has gone beyond and above what is acceptable for our society, what is acceptable for our, uh, for our citizens and voters, but at the same time not introducing a hierarchical and vertical and top-down approach to, to finance and financial markets. So how can we balance these things and how can we add a little bit of the public without really restructuring the, the way in which finance is, is working, is operating. And that's the moment that ESG like, really took, uh, took off and we see a lot of initiatives at the European level, but also at the American level and around the world at the international level, new forms of accounting and et cetera, by saying, okay, we leave players operating according to the way in which they operated, but we ask them to be more transparent and to be more visible when it comes to the um, environmental and social and governance impact that they have on, on society. So the focus was not how we can tame finance or we can direct finance, but how can we make finance more transparent, more visible, and therefore creating a virtuous, uh, virtuous uh, circle by which those well-performing financial actors, those well-performing corporations would be rewarded and those least performing corporations, those least performing uh, financial actors would be punished by the market itself, which I think is one of the interesting narratives that are taking place at the, at the moment, which is this idea that we provide information about environmental and social and governance impact. They mean that there is higher or lower risk 
So if you have a very strong environmental impact, you may be exposed to a higher risk of mitigation, to a higher risk of sanctions, to a higher risk of paying penalties for what you did. If you are violating human rights as a corporation, the same is, is true. If you have a very incoherent set of, of governance structures and rules, uh, you may be creating chaos and you may be inefficient, so you may have the risk of losing money in the future. So the idea underlying ESG as a way of dialoguing between corporations and finance is by saying, if we provide infos, if you provide details to finance, finance will be rewarding those corporations that are assuming a lower risk, and by rewarding the corporation that are assuming lower risk, we will be incentivizing an increasing number of corporations to act and behave better, to increase their environmental standards, to increase their social standards, to be better corporations. So the theory of change, the theory of change is mediated by finance. And that really is what I think is crucial in the difference between the CSR's world, where it was about the public visibility to the, to the broader audience and being somehow accountable, although like even indirectly, with the broader citizenship. And here, where the accountability is vis-a-vis -vis financial investors, financial actors, because the premise is the one that I was mentioning before. Finance is essential. Finance plays a crucial role in our economy. Finance plays uh, a pivotal um, role in building the world after COVID. So let's do our best to support finance, to do what finance can do, which is choosing those investments that are less risky and abandoning those investments that are more risky. So it is important the moment that you create a narrative to understand who is behind the narrative. And that's why we, don't, we do it partially, but then we don't do that too much into this paper because otherwise we're in a, uh, excessive in terms of, of wording, in terms of, of content. But we looked at the role that civil society actually had in defining the EU directive and whether or not the points that civil society was making were integrated and adopted by the directive itself and by the European Commission. And we come out by using secondary information, so it's not a research that we did ourselves, but we come out, came out with this clear understanding that despite what the Commission is saying about civil society and the central role of civil, role of civil society in implementing the directive, civil society's desire were not translated into the directive. So civil society would have wanted something mandatory, would have wanted something stringent, would have wanted something with a high level of accountability. And what we end up having in the directive is um, reporting, statements that have to be made, and the only sanctions that can be uh, committed are sanctions if the reporting is not happening or if the reporting is unfair. But if a company is reporting that they are having a large environmental impact, that is not sanctioned in itself. So it's not mandatory in the sense of taking responsibility for the actions, it's mandatory in the sense of taking responsibility for the reporting. And that really fits in a, uh, in a framework or in a way of understanding the relationship between regulation and, and, and cooperation that is just about transparency and reporting and informing, hoping that then someone else will take the lead and bring the case or uh, use law in order to, to hold these corporations accountable. And that happened with the, with the regulation. Uh, linking to the present, I think, is, is extremely interesting. And it's work that I'm conducting with a colleague in, in Bristol, Daniel Tischer from the um, Faculty of Management at the University of Bristol. It's very interesting to see who are the people who are invited to become experts and who are invited to support the European Commission and the European Parliament in defining the content of sustainable finance in defining the content of what is sustainable, what is green, what is acceptable, and what is not acceptable. And we see some dynamics that are particularly interesting because we see somehow always the same actors and always the same players and always the same organizations occupying multiple spaces and positioning themselves as experts, which means that what they think and the narrative that they're proposing is reproduced in multiple spaces. So it's reproduced in the a uh, high level panel of experts on sustainable finance is reproduced on the, in the working group on the, on the taxonomy. It is reproduced at the national level, uh, for example, in the UK, with the recent documents that came out and they were, they were published. They had behind them organizations that are also connected with what is happening at the European level and at the international level. So one of the interesting things that we also wanted to uh, hit the hat in the document, in the paper, but we don't 
expand because of lack of, of space is who is actually deciding and what it happens when these decisions are made by certain players with certain visions and not by other players with, with other vision in particular vis-a-vis uh, -vis the role that finance should be playing in the future of, uh, of society, in the future of economy. If you only invite people who think that finance is essentially exclusion is good, you'll end up with a regulation, you'll end up with a taxonomy, you'll end up with, a, with standards that take for granted the world of finance. But if you start inviting people who are critical about finance, things may go, may go differently. So we are at this moment now in, 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 in the creation of this, of this regulation where it seems to me and it seems to Doug there too that we have normalized and naturalized the role of finance and from now on we will just see slight, tiny, little uh, discussions about whether or not this is green but there will not be any longer conversation about whether or not finance should be an ally in the future of the, of the economy and the society. Yeah, so... Um... Uh, so th this makes me wonder uh, wonder whether um, uh, you know this sort of skewed conversation uh, may lead to uh, the involvement of the general civil society, especially of that part that uh, disagrees with this indispensability of this vision of finance. Right. So uh, do you think that at least? uh from the point of view of its effects of its application of its enforcement uh this regulation including the especially the directive can somehow promote the participation of civil of civil society in the process of ideation in the future maybe through some tweets uh, or do you think that that's Gonna, I mean, history is going to uh, repeat, and we will see pretty much the same thing that we have seen, that we have witnessed uh, throughout the process of uh, of um, uh, drafting of this law. Well, we we do try to have like a positive or optimistic approach to the to the, to the directive in the in the paper, uh, in the chapter that we call Barry in the Shadow of the Directive, ESG and the Opportunities for Civil Society's Activism. And what we say with, the, with regards to the directive, I think that applies to the broader scenario and the broader area of ESG uh, at whatever level they're going to be implemented and, and, and required. So we do believe that the same is going to be uh, happening with regards to financial investors and uh, the new regulation on, on, on disclosure of financial investors. Uh, we think that something similar may be happening now, maybe happening now with the definition of taxonomy of what is green and what is not green. We think that the same thing may be happening around green bonds and the uh, uniformization and universalization of standards around, around green bonds. So we take an optimistic approach and say, okay, the moment that there are rules and the moment there are requirements and the moment that companies and financial investors are asked to put on their books what they're doing with regards to environment and society and, and governance, that creates some space of, uh, for intervention for civil society. Um, the point is what kind of space that is and what kind of open space that is and, and what kind of implication that participating in that space has. So we, with specific regards to the, to the EU directive, we identify three, three opportunities. Um, the first one is the actual push for the transparency, visibility, and correct implementation of the, of the standards. So for civil society to check the books of companies, to enter into the, the definition of how the accounting is taking place, what is accounted for, what is not accounted for, and using their expertise and using their, their knowledge to point at those companies that are not properly accounting, that are not properly reporting, that are forgetting, they are dismissing, or they are not attributing enough relevance to specific actions. Um, this, for example, uh, to be just one, one possibility, may be done with uh, oil companies when they have to report their environmental impact, for example. Are they reporting on climate change? Are they reporting on the link between extracting oil and uh, the violation of the Paris Agreement, or the impossibility of fitting within the boundaries of the Paris Agreement? Are they actually recognizing the, the, the impact that their actions may have by reporting on them, by accounting financially for them, and by channeling or suggesting to the investors that 
put their money in an oil company may be extremely risky. For example, because governments may impose a carbon tax or governments may decide that the oil has to stay in the ground. And the moment that the governments decide with a regulatory change that the oil has to stay in the ground, that would mean a massive blow to the finance and to the business of the, of the oil company. So third, third uh, sector and civil society can go there, enter into this very technical conversation and see what is accounted for and what isn't accounted for and try to push for a more holistic accounting and for a clear disclosure of the risk, hoping that then finance will recognize that and take the money out from that company. If that's the sort of theory of change, that by exposing the risk that you're facing as a corporation, you may have less access to finance and by having less access to finance, you may weather shut down or have to change your, your practices and do something that is less risky. So we recognize that and recognize that this is a, as an opportunity, but with regards to this opportunity, we also recognize that it requires knowledge, expertise, and technical understanding that we would not normally associate with the third sector that is doing a sort of advocacy work, that is doing a more political work, that is doing trying to bring uh, people together. And we um, represent that by using uh, a job announcement that was uh, issued by the WWF, by the World Wildlife Fund. And they were looking for someone in 2018. And they said that the, they looked for a candidate who was interested in delivering change through the financial sector. So already they were looking for someone who had this interest in leveraging finance, so taking finance for granted. But what they are is that the can candidate had to demonstrate experience working in or related to the financial sector. Ideally, the candidate's particular experience working within the investment, asset manager, or banking sector. The candidate will be able to demonstrate a good understanding of the finance sector and the various avenues for affecting lasting change. So this is a job advertisement issued by one of the largest environmental organizations in the, in the world, one of those big, of the big international NGOs. And if you were to take the profile out of the WWF, that could be working with any other financial institution that you can imagine in the world. Someone who has worked in the financial sector, someone who knows about the financial sector, someone who has worked in banking. And so we started just joking or like uh, wondering what kind of profile the WWF would be at attracting what kind of person would have the knowledge and expertise and know-how that is needed in order to understand finance. It's probably someone who's been trained to work in finance. And so you start populating NGOs and the, and the third sector with financial profiles, with business profiles, with people who have that kind of background that maybe they changed their mind and they wanted to save the planet rather than not saving the planet, but definitely would take finance as natural and inevitable. So you kind of hire the people who already share your idea. And again, like pushing aside, everyone who is potentially thinking that WWF should not be talking to finance or dealing with finance or wondering about whether or not uh, killing a polar bear has an environmental, an environmental impact. The second opportunity that we identify is sort of builds up on, on, on this and it's that of shareholder activism, which is nothing new, has been out there for decades. What we think is that the ESG, by increasing transparency and increasing the relevance of the risk that the companies are, are facing, may provide more opportunities to the third sector to act as interested and concerned shareholders. So what shareholders can do that third sector non-shareholders cannot do is to participate to general assemblies and hold to account the board of directors. So shareholder activism works in, in, in a very straightforward way. Third sector, NGO, civil society buy shares of a company and then push through the general assembly and through the voting rights uh, of, the, of the general assembly, but also through the uh, shareholder rights of having management that is acting with care, that is respecting the, the, the fiduciary duty, etc push for more accountability to board the directors. And so what we think is that if you increase the level of, of transparency, if you increase the level of visibility of the risk, you may provide with more tools and more weapons those shareholders, uh, th those third sector uh, actors interested in leveraging shareholder activism. So when they go to the General Assembly or when they are filing uh, an action against the board of directors, they will have more information 
to make the case that the directors are not respecting the fiduciary duty, they're not respecting the, the duties towards the shareholders, they're not respecting the, uh, their obligations vis-a-vis -vis -vis the shareholders. As interesting as it is, like shareholder activism has been existing for, for decades, as I was saying, it's nothing, it's nothing new per se, still it's based on a theory of change that we think is, is a little bit uh, indirect in the sense that you hope that by holding the shares of a company, you would be capable of changing the company from within. And really, you then again have to present your argument according to that hyper technical, hyper uh, uh, procedural way that ESG and accounting and reporting for sustainability require. The third opportunity, which is like a, a something that has been less discussed in, in literature and less discussed by, by academics and practitioners in general, it to, is to realize that in the case of the European Union, we have not only the European level, but we also have the national level. So we have so far 28 countries, 27 uh, pretty soon, and there are national uh, regulations that have been implemented and legal framework that have been implemented as a transposition of the directive. And each of these national legislation has a requirement with regards to what accounting is, what reporting is, how it has to happen, and what are the kind of procedures and the substantive elements that each corporation has to, has to follow. So we didn't do the, the study ourselves, we didn't go and check every single legislation, but we used studies that have been done. And interestingly, you discover that there are legislations like Italy that put a lot of uh, pressure on the board of directors with regards to that specific um, disclosure. So in Italy, the omission of relevant information, non-compliance of failure to submit within the required time frame entails a penalty that goes between 20,000 and 150,000 uh, euros. Uh, in Denmark, the, the violation of the Danish Financial Statement Act, uh, which has uh, received the directive, uh, can also be resulting in fines. And something similar can be done in, uh, in France, where uh, while in Germany, the courts can inflict penalties up to the amount which is the highest, between 10 million euro or 5% of the annual turnover of the company. So we said, well, maybe ESG in itself is not transformative, it's not like a, the solution to all problems, but then if at the national level, we engage with the accounting procedure, we engage with the books, we engage with the reporting, and we show that there is no compliance, that elements are missing, that the way in which uh, situations are reported is not appropriate, maybe companies can start being fined, and maybe boards uh, of directors start uh, holding the financial responsibility for, for their misconduct, and that maybe can change their practices, which means that they can start reporting for things that they're not reporting without changing their conducts, or they may change their conducts because they don't want to report on the environmental and social and governance impact that their, their company is, uh, is having. Uh, on that side, I think that there has been not enough and that there has been not a, a clear engagement because Probably at the national level, there is not that expertise and that knowledge and that uh, engagement with, with finance that we see at the European or international level. But of course, we ask ourselves whether we need more of that expertise at the national level to the detriment of other forms of expertise that the third sector and civil society may have, um, or just we should be dismissing the possibility of engaging with ESG and, and civil society and the third sector should be doing um, other things and should be engaging with corporations according to other parameters and according to other other guidelines that are not just the technicalities of what is contained in the sustainability report. Yeah, uh, yeah. This makes me think of two main things. First of all, I was wondering: so uh, the, are these um, only administrative fines that though can be triggered by uh, by what? So an investigation of uh, of, a, of an, a national authority or is it litigation based? So it, I, do they have more a remedial nature so that, for example, civil society uh, can have a, an active role in the overall proceeding, in the, in the proceedings? Or is it mostly led by uh, administrative authorities or national administrative authorities? 
the latter. Uh, okay. Like any form of reporting and accounting that I'm aware of, it's then it becomes a bilateral relationship between the company and the you know, financial authorities in, a, in the state. So it's up to the financial authorities to identify the gaps, to identify what is missing, or to identify what has been done in non compliance, and then uh, raise the concern and, and, and commit fines and, and penalties. And then, of course, that can be appealed, that can be you know, opposed by, by the company. So it's not uh, as easy as uh, it, could, uh, it may be or it should be. Yeah, but this though uh, raises exactly the question that you were posing before that is, uh, you know, the benchmark uh, that is used in order to measure these, these infringements. So, uh, as you said before, and as you uh, also examined in the paper, um, according to the ESG, what they have to do is particular, it's in practice to, um, uh, to give an economic value uh, to uh, conducts that are not naturally prone to be, uh, you know, summarized by a number. Because how do you give an economic value to uh, environmental or social damages or harms or any sort of um, conduct that has an impact on, um, on society and the environment? Uh, here it becomes really important for me to decide what is, uh, if one has to do this job, uh, what is the benchmark used to measure it? Obviously, I can imagine that uh, financial authorities we use the benchmark that they are mostly accustomed to. So, uh, in particular, you know the ones that uh, traditional economic theory um, utilizes. So, you know, from uh, in particular looking at uh, at these. Um, uh, at these damages from the point of view of, uh, for example, consumer welfare, but not only, uh, you know. Um, but here, so to, I have two questions for you. Do you think that it's, it is possible to give an, an economy, to, to uh, economize somehow, to summarize these damages uh, with a number uh, using these economic benchmarks? And secondly, do you think that this is necessary so that uh, in our uh, legal environment, uh, we are supposed to uh, economize every single fact, every single legal interest that is involved in a dispute or that anyway is involved in a, in a, in a specific situation in order to balance them between them? So here it's, it, it's nothing more than a, a balancing exercise, right? So do you think that we are supposed to economize them or because we are talking about the financial sector, or do you think that there is an alternative to that? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the, that's the core of the, of the paper and that's the core of the reflections that we wanted to have and we, we keep it to the fourth section and to the conclusion of the, of the paper because we wanted to have an optimistic uh, inception but then really going into the, the core of what we think is happening in the moment that you financialize and the moment in which you put finance and financial interest and financial reasoning at the center of transformative policies or fields of change. So the, the short answer to your two main points and then a little bit of reflection on what is happening and what we say in the paper. So is it possible to give a price tag or to put a price tag on everything? Possibility in the sense that uh, we do it, yes. Uh, we give a price tag on you know, a physical uh, damage or a physical harm that we can suffer in a car accident. We give a price tag on there is environmental destruction as forest. We associate a, a price and we condemn companies to be paid when there are human rights abuses, whether there is child labor, whether there is like contamination of water, there is always going to be an economization of the uh, of the impact and an economization of the damage because that's the way in which uh, our thought systems but, uh, are, are structured. That you give a price tag and then someone pays because of the damage that they have created. Now, the fact that we can do that doesn't mean that that is the only way or that is needed. And it doesn't mean that is the most uh, desirable way of, of looking at the solution. Uh, of course, it's needed the moment that you operate within the framework of the ESG and you operate within the framework 
of financial return and financial investment. So the ESG and the directive and the entire sustainable finance uh, narrative is about rewarding those who accept less risk and sanctioning those who accept uh, higher risk. And rewarding means that you keep your shares and you keep investments in that company and sanctioning means that you withdraw your money or you force them to have a behavioral change. But the way in which you assess whether they are taking or not taking risk is by accounting how much money they may lose if something happens or how much money they will lose because something happened. So this entire idea of rewarding and sanction is based on the financial return, is based on the financial opportunity for investors. So inherent to the idea of financializing is to try to convince with a monetary argument, the financial investors and the corporations that something has to change. And we tell them that the risk of uh, regulatory reform and a carbon tax or the risk of a regulatory reform that forces oil companies to keep the oil on the ground will mean that amount of money that the investor will lose and therefore the investor has to consider whether or not it is uh, compatible with their duty to keep the shares into an oil company. Uh, the same thing with environmental disaster, the same thing with human rights uh, obligation. In order to convince finance that operates according to revenues, that operates according to discounting future returns and uh, that return on investment, the ROI, you have to tell them how much money they're going to be making or how much money they're not going to be making. That's the only way in which you can have a dialogue with them. So essential legal tools like the fiduciary duty and what is an obligation of the reasonable person to manage the money means what is reasonable because of the money that you're going to be making and what is unreasonable because of the money that you're going to be, going to be losing. So if you accept the financialization of this entire and this entire narrative of finance in the ESG, you have to put a price tag. Otherwise, you are operating alone, like on a, on a different arena, on a different, uh, on a different terrain. And that is really the consideration that we made. So what happens the moment that you decide that you talk to finance, dialogue with finance, and you financialize your interactions around environment and society, you are forced to give a price tag. You are forced to accept that there is going to be a price put on life, a price put on environment, a price put on uh, the future of society, the price put on uh, the survival of the species, the price put on everything. And by putting that price, you will then go and dialogue with board of directors and investments offices to tell them that the money should not go somewhere right? and should go somewhere else, which may be a very reasonable way of acting, but that has clear implications. And the main implication that, uh, that we find is exactly what you were mentioning about, which is the idea of how do we account for certain things? And can we just take for granted that everything is, a, is an object, is a commodity, everything is a price, and everything can be you know, traded on the basis of a, of a financial and monetary value rather than for other values, uh, which cannot be given uh, a price, cannot be given uh, a number, and because they are incommensurable, because they are the survival of the species, because they are biodiversity, because they are whatever. Can we really give a price tag to all of that? Or shall we really give a price, to, price tag to all of that? So our response in the paper is that we shall not, and therefore we should not enter into this financialized interaction and financialized understanding of the environment and society, because we have to push back this idea that everything can be uh, given a price tag and everything can be represented as a commodity with a freedom exchange value. And in the case of the EU directive, and in the case of sustainable finance, I think is even worse than that, because it's not about a damage, but it's about risk. So how do you account for risk? And how do you account for the likelihood of risk? And how do you account for risk that is uh, actual or potential, which is what the, what the directive says. So at the end of the day, like if you enter into this dynamic of allocating a price tag and, and transforming and representing into accountable numbers the world around us, you of course are going to be abandoning, marginalizing, and putting aside all those other ways of seeing nature and society that are not monetary, that are not about the return on investment, that are not about making money out of. And we really wanted to make the case strongly that if organization, NGOs, civil society, care about 
a non-commodified vision of society and the environment, a non-monetary vision of society and environment, they cannot enter into the ESG arena, they cannot enter into this ESG dialogue, or will they, they will be forced to resonate and, re and, and reflect around this, um, these guidelines, and then they cannot complain the moment that a price is put on the survival of polar bears in the Northern Pole, and that price is considered to be acceptable because the return on the investment that is associated to the extinction of polar bears is higher than the cost of retain for polar bears. So if that's the case, I think it's very important that this society understands what is going to be missed and what they're going to be losing in terms of the opportunities of presenting a case that is not rationally defined around accounting and prices and return on investment that is based on political and ethical principles and legal principles like the respect of human rights should not have a price. It should be independent on how much it is going to be costing the company to respect human rights, at least uh, we think. The other element that makes this entire ESG narrative more complicated and even more problematic is that accounting, of course, uh, is about the economic impact of a certain activity. And I've been using a lot of the word impact in the, throughout the last, uh, the last minutes, but the terminology the directive actually uses is materiality. So the directive tells us that companies have to account only for those environmental and social and governance issues that are material. And material means that they are actually or are likely to affect the business of the company. If something is not affecting the business of the company, it's not material. And if it's not material, you should not be accounting for that. Which means if you get rid of polar bears in, North, um, in the Northern Pole and no one is going to be knowing it and no one is going to be filing a case against you, no one is asking you to pay or there is no likelihood that you're ever going to be paying for that, that risk is not material. So you can end up in a situation where you still have environmental degradation, you still have social uh, exploitation, you still have confused governance that leads to you know, appropriation of capital in a way that is unfair and unjust, but that will not be accounted because it's not material, because there is not going to be an economic risk associated to that. And that really is the core of all the things. Are we accepting that only what is relevant for finance matters and not what is relevant for everyone else? And our answer, which is straightforward, is no, that's not acceptable. We cannot build a future where only what is material for finance is accounted for, is relevant, and actually is taken into consideration. We have to build a future that is based on different premises where things matter because they matter for survival of the species, they matter for survival of the planet, they matter for, for equality and justice and, uh, and equity, not just because they have a material impact on the return on investment of BlackRock or Vanguard or any financial uh, investor out there. So we do believe that there is a lot to miss and a lot to be lost in the moment where civil society and the third sector play according to the rules and play according to the narratives and the standards and the vision of finance. And even more, the moment that we normalize and universalize this idea, as the European Parliament says, that finance is an essential tool for the future of humanity and finance is an essential tool for the implementation of the Paris Agreement or for any other thing. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like uh, EU regulators or national regulators are going into the direction of moving away from ESG, actually they are intensifying it. And they are doing their best in order to come out with taxonomies, standards, way of accounting that are more holistic. But it's not so much about how you account, but it's about what is not accounted for, what is excluded by the simple fact that we have to give a price tag on the things. And we, we start the chapter with a, a reference to what uh, Cristobal Colón, like uh, Columbus, was doing in, 19, in, in 1492, when uh, Columbus got to uh, Santo Domingo with the boat, the first thing that uh, he did was accounting for the economic potential of the island and accounting for the economic relevance of what he had just discovered. How much money can we make out of that? But of course, he accounted for a lot of positive things, but he didn't account for the negative things that were going to happen. He did not account for what he didn't want to see. He did not account for what 
was going to be all the negative implication. He didn't account for things that he knew was not going to pay for. So we are worried that 600 years uh, later, or 500 and something years later, by relying so much on accounting, reporting, giving a price tag, and this idea that you know, finance knows better and finance has clearly understood what is good and what is bad for planet and people, we're doing nothing more than just letting finance decide what is worth it and what is not worth it. And we don't believe that the role of um, you know, interested, invested academics, legal activists like we are, or civil society or, or third sector organizations or international organizations should be that of accepting that the rules of the game and what is worth it and what is not worth it is defined by financial investors whose main priority is rewarding capital and remunerating um, you know, investors and talent seeking. And then on top of everything, 12 years ago, let the, let the entire planet on one of the deepest economic crises that we ever experienced. It's probably now a little bit less problematic than the COVID one. But again, 12 years after the financial meltdown, in the aftermath of another economic crisis, give it more relevance, more power, and more authority to finance, just because finance as capital, I think is a very simplistic and deductive understanding of how the world is structured and what the implications are going to be. And also, like, it's very sad from the perspective of the regulator that somehow giving up any role in, in shaping society, but just structuring it according to the vision of the investors and to the vision of uh, investment offices and what they consider to be valuable or not valuable. And I think that what is valuable and not valuable in a democratic context of 7.7 uh, you know, .7 billion people uh, and climate emergency should not be defined by white men in a suit in an investment office, but should be defined in a little bit of a different way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I, I I was referring probably exactly to this when when I talked about you know when I mentioned um, the, how the conversation was skewed toward finance in the sense that uh, if we look at these, um, uh, so I, I I'm just recalling the last thing, the last bit of your of your answer of. Um, uh, of your arguments and uh, if we look at these problems only from the perspective of finance uh, we there is no doubt in saying that uh, this would okay there is no doubt uh, is a strong word from my perspective this may uh, lead to a consistent underestimation at least uh, if not disregard, but at least a, a consistent underestimation of the value of environmental social impact. Because as you said before, you know, uh, the, uh, it's mainly based on a risk assessment from a financial perspective, right? So this price tag, this price tag is mostly based on risk assessment on, uh, from a financial perspective. And since historically, this risk, this risk has been always relatively low, the, the number, the price tag that we put on these, um, on the protection of these, uh, of these values, such as uh, the environment and, and social sustainability, would be in inevitably low. They cannot be higher than that, right? Because it's the benchmark that we are using uh, that uh, it's a one-sided benchmark. That's obviously normal because if you, um, if you look at this situation only from the position of finance, how could it be otherwise, right? Um, so I, to be honest, I, I completely agree with this view of your, uh, at least the, with this doubt that you insinuate in your paper, saying, uh, are we sure that this is the only way to look at this situation, um, to look at the impact of these conducts on the market? So should we look at it only from the perspective of finance or, uh, can, can, can we also explore other ways of, uh, of looking at them? Uh, perhaps, I haven't really thought about it, perhaps there is a different way of measuring impact from the perspective of finance that doesn't lead to this consistent, un, consistent underestimation of their value. Perhaps there is, uh, but if there is, maybe you can tell me better, uh, nobody has come up with a better way to do that. 
Um, but uh, looking ahead, uh, do you think that um, the, these the, that 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 there are uh, alternative, either bottom up or uh, top down initiatives that may lead to a real change, uh, either in measuring again these these impacts or in completely changing the our approach to uh, balancing between environment, so non-economic factors and economic factors and financial factors. Uh, when it comes to a firm's responsibility toward uh, or its overall conduct on the market? Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of things that you, that you mentioned. I, um, I think the biggest question is what is value? And if there is value that is, cannot be expressed in monetary terms. And I do believe that monetary terms is just one way of representing part of what we consider to be, to be value is a very much simplistic understanding of, of value as something that can be bought and sold. Uh, and I believe that in particular when it comes to the environment and to society, there, there are other uh, forms of values that are not monetary, that are not commodified, that are not tangible. And I think that the moment that we accept to put a price tag on environment and society, we're just automatically dismissing all of that. And I don't think that we should be finding a way in order to associate a value to the loss of cultural diversity, of the loss of biodiversity, of the loss of an entire species. I think there are certain things that are clearly incommensurable, that clearly cannot be accounted for. And because they cannot be accounted for, I don't think that the solution is ignoring them. The solution is not basing our engagement with the survival of the planet, the survival of the web of life, the survival of society on the basis of accounting. If there's something that cannot be accounted, the problem is not that they cannot be accounted, the problem is that we try to account for everything and therefore we should be changing, I think, the way in which we engage with that. And then it takes me to, to the point on, on alternatives and, and I think that the alternative is not so much about how do we do accounting better, as I was saying, it's not about improving ESG, it's not about trying to bring everything together because if we do that, we're just legitimizing the idea that finance is essential, that private finance is pivotal, that private finance knows better and that, you know, the world will be saved by someone who wants to make between 7 and 12 percent of investment every year because their economic motive they will clearly reward those that are that must be rewarded that will clearly take the money away from those who should not be getting the money there's so much wrong in this assumption i think first of all finance in the last 12 years has proved that they don't put the money where it's better for the planet and for, for society they have proved that they put the money everywhere. So there is an overaccumulation of capital that was clear before 2008, so that they put all the money into CDOs, they collateralized the default obligation, the, and, and the debt obligation, they put the money into swaps, they put the money in everything that they could put money in because they had too much money. So by saying you only put the money where it's good, you assume that there is a limited amount of resources that is going into the financial market, but the, the amount of resources is amazingly big, incredibly big. We're talking about $86 trillion, I think, in, in, in managed by asset manager in the world, which is way beyond what would be needed in order to guarantee not only the respect of all the social needs of every single person in the world, but also to immediately reach uh, what is needed in terms of, uh, of, the, of the Paris Agreement. But they're not putting the money there where it can be good for the planet or good, good for, for society because there are not this kind of uh, opportunities at the moment, but also because they are extremely happy to put money in companies like Aramco, like the Saudi Arabian oil national companies, that as soon as decided to privatize part of its uh, shares was flooded by requests by big banks like BNP Paribas, for example, who at the same time have their green projects and their green uh, green investment. So relying on the possibility to move capital away means that we are really a, a very uh, shallow and naive understanding of, uh, of the intensity and, and, the, and the leverage of the financial market and also that you know, return on investment has to be high, it has to be, has to be immediate and there are certain investments that are high risk, high reward that will be continue to be, to be followed. So I think that the true reform is to get you know, move aside and push aside from this idea of the centrality of, of, of private finance 
and really operate at different levels, but mainly I think two trajectories. The first one is bringing back public finance and bringing back public money for public utility and public values, where investments are not realized in order to generate a 12% return, but investments are, uh, are realized in order to achieve those values or those utilities that are essential. So you can see the role of central banks, you can see the role of uh, organizations like the Casa Deposito Prestito in Italy, which is you know, like a similar uh, organization in France and other places. So public uh, holdings of resources that can be deployed in order to promote some of those investments that we otherwise want private finance to do. But also wondering if we can really rethink the role of, of finance in general. So finance is putting money today to make a return tomorrow in the next years uh, thanks to the growth and expansion of that project or is lending money today in order to make money out of that and the repayment of the interest in the coming 20 years which still requires a growth and an expansion of the underlying economic activity. So finance is, in particular private finance, is intrinsically connected with the idea of growth and expansion and we all know that on a finite planet, there is no space for unlimited growth and unlimited expansion. So we, I think we really have to change the premises and we really have to question whether or not we can continue to grow or we should start thinking about other ways of operating. And I think that the answer to me is pretty straightforward. Like we cannot continue growing and not even at the lower pace that we are doing at the moment. So we have to rethink the way in which we find resources and we find uh, projects. And that's the moment where the state should spend less time coming out with standards and indicators and should spend more time coming out with sanctions, implementation of uh, laws and obligations and requirements and duties that already exist uh, that guarantee you know, dignity of life conditions, that guarantee that pollution is not happening, that guarantee environmental protection, that guarantee uh, the survival of biodiversity by imposing or putting forward the broader collective interest to a society that respects the planetary boundaries and respects social boundaries, rather than putting forward the interest of finance and by saying, you know better, so you go and create the world that everyone wants to, wants to live in. And I think that that really is going to be marginalized and put on aside if we engage with finance and we take for granted that finance is the solution. So, which is really that the last point that I, that I want to make, which is, if we start engaging with finance, there is no way we criticize and challenge the systemic problems and the systemic inequality and the systemic misdistribution that capitalism and a society based on, on accumulation of profit and, and expansion have been generating, both to society and to the environment. But if we really care about systemic problems, root causes, and etc., we cannot ask those who are responsible to find a solution. We just have to rethink the, the underlying premises. And again, Unfortunately, COVID is going exactly in the opposite direction, despite the fact that for a few weeks we thought that it may be leading to a different new normality that was not based on the same premises. We see clearly that we have moved away from the transition into recovery. And talking about recovery means putting economic growth, putting employment, putting jobs, putting expansion at the center. And that is it clearly stated at the European level, clearly stated at the US level and clearly stated at Chinese level. And if that is the premise, I think that unfortunately it's probably already too late to rethink about uh, the, the underlying issues and the underlying problems. So what will be uh, allowed and what will be available in the future would be the possibility to fight from within using ESG and using the standard standards and then a strong political campaign from outside that doesn't accept what has been created and really looks for a redefinition and, and reconception of the role that public authority regulation and the public in general have vis-a-vis -vis the role of private finance and private capital. Yeah, thank you very much, Tommaso, for uh, again for uh, for, for talking to us, it, it was really a lot of food for thought. So we were um, uh, we were talking about your paper. I would like to say that again because I don't think that I mentioned the full title of the paper before: the financialization, the financialization of civil society activism 
sustainable finance, non-financial disclosure, and the shrinking space for engagement that you co-authored with Davide Cerrato. Uh, it's been just published in, uh, uh, let, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, in the journal Accounting, Economics and Law. Uh, is that correct? It's correct. It's called okay. Convivium, Accounting, Economics and Law. Convivium. A Convivium. Okay, perfect. So whoever wants to read and they should, uh, they, they can find it uh, already published online. And uh, it, it, was, uh, it was really a lot of food for thought for everybody. I think that uh, you know, a, anybody who is active at the, at the intersection of law, economics, finance, and, and developmental studies, but also uh, sustainability. So there is, uh, I, I think there are many stakeholders that would be interested in getting to know a little bit better these um, uh, the, the, this very engaging part of the overall conversation on law, economics, and sustainability, uh, they should definitely read this paper and possibly get in touch with you, right? Of course, of course. Like with uh, always with pleasure, and we know that there is a lot that we still have to learn and a lot that we can still contribute to. And uh, definitely, that's part of a broader project. We are looking at green bonds in particular. We're looking at taxonomies. We're looking at networks of of lobbies and capture of the of the regulators. So anyone interested in getting in touch can find my email address on the uh, paper. Uh, so when you read the paper, you can also find my email address. Otherwise, you can Google me uh, at the University of the, of the Law Faculty and the Institute of Development Policy um, with my name and surname. It's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot, Claudia, for, for inviting me. Thanks a lot for, for having me and, and definitely congrats for these initiatives of this. Uh, taking the, the downside of the of COVID and the, and the social distancing to, to create some space for the other of dialogue and international dialogue, which is definitely appreciated and something that I may steal from you for, for the next day. I, I would be happy of doing that. And by the way, uh, it was my pleasure. And next time we should uh, think of doing the same thing involving also uh, developing countries. You know that I'm talking to you from Central Asia. Uh, here the topic is pretty hot uh, because here they are trying to develop their financial markets. Um, uh, but again, they are trying to do that on the blueprint of what Europe and the United States in particular have done in the past and are doing nowadays. Uh, so uh, I think that um, they are learning a lot. Uh, everybody's learning a lot for more what's happening uh, in Europe and in the United States. And I know that my colleagues would be very happy to hear what and read what you have to say but i think that a a, a debate and a discussion a bilateral discussion of what's going on here uh, and in other developing countries and uh, i know that you are very interested in that that's why i'm proposing that to you uh, and uh, what's going on in europe would be beneficial for both uh, systems yeah, and uh, so I really look forward. I will definitely try to involve you again in a project like that. Uh, hopefully you will accept. And, uh, uh, and it, again, it was a real pleasure. Thanks a lot, Claudio. Thanks a lot to everyone who made it till the, the end of this interview. And thanks a lot to all of you who will be then going and checking the, the paper and uh, getting in touch for, for comments and uh, suggestions. And stay safe. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>